thank you so much for joining us. I'm Bridget Anderson, the President and CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, and absolutely delighted to see so many here this morning on International Women's Day. So celebrate women, yes. I would like to acknowledge and celebrate all of the women in this room and in our community, and a special shout out to my mom who is here today, Denise. I would like to acknowledge with gratitude that we are gathered today on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. We are honoured to live and work and play on these lands, and we are committed to working with our local First Nations toward a shared vision to make Vancouver stronger and our region thriving on its true history, partnerships and business landscape. With Canadians expecting to go to the polls on or before October of 2025, affordability challenges for businesses and individuals, the housing crisis, Public safety, those are just some of the top issues of mine for the business community and individuals alike. And for the first time, on behalf of our 5,000 members, most of which are small and medium businesses, the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade is delighted to welcome to our stage the leader of the Canadian Conservative Party and official opposition, the Honourable Pierre Polyev. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonne journée internationale des femmes, surtout à ma mère, à ma fille et ma femme, à mes, pa mes trois patronnes. Uh, et uh, ça me fait plaisir d'être ici pour parler de mon plan de gros bon sens pour couper les taxes et impôts, bâtir des logements, réparer le budget et stopper les crimes. C'est ça le gros bon sens et ce dont nous avons besoin après huit ans de Justin Trudeau et le bloc qui n'en vaut pas le coup. Hi everyone, happy International Women's Day, especially to my mother, my daughter, and my wife, my three bosses in this world. I want to thank the uh, Board of Trade for the long-standing 18-month invitation that they have had uh, for me to come here today. And I don't want you to feel bad about the time it took because this is the first time I have spoken to either a Chamber of Commerce or a Board of Trade since I became leader of the Common Sense Conservatives two years ago. During that time, I have spoken at uh, 110 shop floors and, and five union local facilities. And uh, the reason why this is only my first a Chamber or Board of Trade is nothing to do with my view on business. I love business. I love free enterprise. I love the people who risk their, their entire worth in order, their entire family savings in order to start a business and build their dreams. Rather, the reason it, this is my first time speaking to a business association or of this type is because my experience with the corporate lobbyists in Ottawa, the main groups there, have been that they have been utterly useless in advancing any uh, common sense interests for the people on the ground. Um, the corporate lobbyists in Ottawa are focused on getting lunches with ministers at the Rideau Club or uh, showing off their latest ESG brochure um, or expecting that politicians are going to do things for them without actually convincing the people on the, co on the ground of the, w of the benefit to them. My common sense plan to ax the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime, is a bottom-up free enterprise agenda, not a top-down state capitalism agenda. It is not about politicians and uh, CEOs uh, working together for their own interests. It is about unleashing the power of free enterprise so that workers and entrepreneurs and consumers can exchange the voluntary ex uh, purchase of goods for services goods for, for, for dollars, of investment for interest, and of work for wages. It is about putting people back in charge of their lives. And my message to corporate Canada is that when I'm Prime Minister, if you want any of your policy agenda pushed forward, you're going to have to convince not just me, 
but the people of Canada that it is good for them. For too long, uh, corporate leaders have thought that their role is simply to write a policy statement and expect it to be implemented. Uh, meanwhile, it has been left to workers on the ground and First Nations in their communities to fight for the projects that have been good for them, projects that are ultimately blocked by government gatekeepers uh, and left uh, leaving th those workers and those communities uh, on the sidelines. And so um, when I'm Prime Minister, my obs obsession, my daily obsession, will be about what is good for the working class people of this country. And uh, I'm going to go through my common sense plan now and talk, why, talk about why this plan is not only uh, popular, the one obviously very popular with the, with the people, we've seen the results of the, we've obviously seen the public opinion data showing that people overwhelmingly support my common sense plan, but why this plan is necessary to turn our economy around. Let's start with the, the state of play in Canada. After eight years of Justin Trudeau and the NDP, everything costs more. Food prices have risen faster than at any time in 40 years. This is because of a carbon tax that has increased the cost for the farmers who produce the food, the truckers who ship the food, the grocers who sell the food. A carbon tax that is scheduled to quadruple over the next five and a half years and which will go up on April 1st. Now, the NDP in this province has agreed to implement that tax, where in other provinces the local government has said no and therefore Trudeau has imposed it from above, here the NDP has enthusiastically embraced the goal of raising energy prices on working class families and has committed to go ahead with the hike this coming April 1st, a 23% carbon tax hike that will make life more expensive for everyday Canadians who are already unable to eat. This is happening in the context of two million annual visits, two million annual visits to food banks, a massive 32% increase over eight years ago. And there are now a third of charities in Canada that are actually turning people away from food banks because they do not have enough food for them. So now, we have a new phenomenon in Canada. It's a Facebook network with 8,000 members called the Dumpster Diving Network. This is a group of Canadians who share tips on how you can eat out of a garbage can in Canada. You only have to take a drive around communities uh, across this country to see the, dent the tent cities that pop up. This existed in the downtown east side of Vancouver for some time, but the model of downtown east side has been spread right across the country. And for example, on the other side of the nation, in Halifax, they have 30 homeless encampments. This is exactly the worst time to raise the cost of food. And that is why I am announcing today that I'm calling on NDP Premier David Eby and Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh to cancel the April 1st carbon tax hike, spike the hike, and axe the tax. <laughs> this is a tax that, to, by the way, targets small businesses. I, one, thing, one reason I chose this association to speak to is because you represent a lot of small businesses, entrepreneurial, bottom-up enterprises. Uh, there are good, BC actually has good associations for business. You guys represent the entrepreneurial sector, unlike some of their other corporate centers where they're focused on representing uh, large protected corporations. You have entrepreneurial bottom-up businesses who are getting hit exceptionally hard. There has been no rebate for the carbon tax for small businesses. In fact, in BC, there's no rebate for anyone. But small businesses are going to pay this tax without having any compensation. And of course, they often, you can say, they, you know, Trudeau will say, pass it on to consumers. Well, in some cases you can't because you're up against foreign competitors who don't pay the carbon tax. In other words, this tax is forcing our businesses to send their money and their jobs to other countries 
from whom we will import those things back to Canada. Let me give you a very simple example of this. Suntech tomatoes in Manitek, they, in the south of Ottawa, they grow tomatoes, as the name would suggest. They have greenhouses, and Trudeau charges the carbon tax on the CO2 they release into the greenhouse, even though that CO2 is absorbed by the plant life. Apparently, he missed that day in science class. It doesn't even go into the atmosphere. So the consequence of this is the government sends a price signal to Manitech customers to buy Mexican tomatoes, which have to be shipped right across North America, burning fossil fuels on trucks and trains. So the consumer buys the more polluting foreign tomato at the disadvantage of the greener and cleaner Canadian tomato. We are, expo we are, we are sending our jobs and our money to other more polluting countries in the process. In fact, the solution to fight climate change is to do precisely the opposite, to bring it home to our clean and our environmentally responsible industries in this country. Uh, let me give you an example of how we can do that. Natural gas. We have 1,300 trillion cubic feet of natural gas beneath our feet. We have clean hydroelectricity, cold weather, which allows us to liquefy it with 25% less energy than is used in the United States of America, because after all, Converting gas into a liquid is a process of cooling it down. And what do we have in Canada? Our most abundant national, natural resource is cold weather. <laughs> that you don't know anything about that in British Columbia. So no complaining for many of you. But it get, you have no idea how cold it gets in Ottawa. In fact, last winter it was so cold, Justin Trudeau was seen with his hands in his own pockets. Um, <laughs> But think about the incredible opportunity we have here. So, you know, we have LNG Canada, approved by the previous Harper Conservative government, uh, with the wise counsel of the great uh, ministers, Ed Fast, Carrie Lynn Finley, and James Moore, who all championed the project for British Columbia. It came as a result of Alice Ross, who was the chief of the HESL at the time, and a future Conservative Member of Parliament for Nordish, Northern British Columbia. $40 billion, the biggest project in Canadian history of any kind, public or private. It will, it will reduce millions of tons of greenhouse gases because it will be the lowest emitting facility in the world and it will displace megawatts generated by coal in Asia. Now, this is the solution to reducing greenhouse gases. The biggest reduction in North America in greenhouse gases happened not because of a carbon tax in Canada, but because of the massive conversion of electrical facilities in the United States from coal to natural gas due to the fracking revolution. In the United States, the U.S. shifted from coal to gas. U.S. electricity produced 2.5 million, two, two, sorry, 2,000 544 million metric tons in, BC, in 2005, that reduced down to 1,724 metric tons of greenhouse gases. That's a 32% reduction in the amount of GHGs coming from the American electrical grid as a direct result of shifting from coal to, to natural gas. National Bank points out that if we were able to sell our natural gas to India, and we were able to replace their plan to double coal-fired electricity and instead use natural gas, it would reduce emissions so much that it would be the equivalent savings of four years of the total emissions of the entire Canadian economy. So get this straight, of all the emissions we produce in one year, we could do four times those reductions by simply helping India expand its electrical generation using gas instead of coal. We have uh, the fifth biggest supply of gas anywhere on Earth. We have the shortest shipping distance to both Asia and Europe. And uh, we have the clean hydroelectricity in BC, Newfoundland, and Quebec with which to liquefy and compress that gas. We have the Germans who asked us to send them our natural gas so did the Japanese, 
Trudeau told them there was no business case. Well, nobody told the Americans there was no business case. They built seven liquefaction facilities in the last eight years. Nobody told the Qataris. They've doubled their production and just signed a 3.5 million metric ton deal with the French. Nobody told the Germans. They just built an import terminal from concept to completion in 194 days, during which time we have not completed a single solitary export plant. My common sense plan will repeal C-69 and grant rapid permits to environmentally friendly and strategically important projects like LNG facilities. We will cool that gas to minus 161 degrees Celsius, ship it off to Asia to shut down dirty Asian coal fire plants, and send it off to Europe to turn dollars for dictators into paychecks for our people in this country. Bring it home. And we will speed up mining. We will speed up mining. Right now, it takes 18 years to get a mine approved in Canada. 40% longer in Canada than in the United States of America. Two years longer than the average of major mining countries. That's why we do not produce any of the lithium that goes in the electric car batteries that you see uh, in Teslas and other cars driving around our streets. We have the fifth biggest supply of lithium on Earth and we only have one operational mine, which, by the way, Trudeau sold to China, so that they can take our mineral and upgrade it and send it back to us after they've burnt a lot of coal to do it. Somehow this is supposed to be good for our environment. We should be the fastest place to grant responsible mining permits so that we can harvest these resources here in this country. And that's what we will do in order to allow for electrification. It is by green lighting green projects like that. We should also speed up the approval of nuclear power. Clean, green, emissions-free, small modular nuclear reactors and can-do production will allow us to have solid, emissions-free, baseload production. It is through this energy abundance that we can bring down costs and emissions at the same time. But it will only happen if we repeal the insane anti-development laws that we have right now. We, thank you. But let me be very clear with you. It will not be a free ride for the resource corporations who have proposed these projects and then sat back and done nothing to convince people of their benefits. They are going to have to stand up and fight. Because frankly, when I meet with resource companies in Ottawa, they come to Ottawa, and all they do is suck up to the Liberal government. They have no backbone and no courage, and they don't fight for their workers. I want to see corporate leaders actually fighting for their workers and fighting for the paychecks instead of sucking up to the very people who are blocking these jobs and destroying our working class. You know, I'll give you an example of this. There's another tax hike coming. All the taxes that are going up after, uh, on April 1st, it's enough to drive a man to drink. But they're taxing that too. There's a beer tax going up on April 1st. So the Association of Beer Producers is running an ad, and they say in the ad that Ottawa is raising beer taxes. And so I asked one of the CEOs, I said, who is Ottawa? I've never met him. What does he look like? Handsome guy? Tall? Fluffy hair? Baby blue eyes? Like, who is Ottawa? Why is the ad saying Ottawa's raising beer tax? Ottawa's not raising beer taxes. Justin Trudeau and the NDP are raising beer taxes. Now, I know a lot of corporate leaders don't want to say things like that because they want to get along with everybody. But sucking up to the people who are doing the damage has only got us into this mess in the first place. So it's time for the business leadership to, to speak the truth and stop sucking up to the people who are doing the damage to our country. Because I can tell you the workers on the ground and the customers who are paying the bills, they're ready for, for, for their leaders to champion them at all levels, and that is what we will expect. And we will expect the same in housing. My second major priority is to build the homes. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. Rent has doubled, mortgage payments have doubled, down payments have all doubled. It has been double trouble. Let's look at how insane it is in Canada today. Right now, housing costs are 25 to 45% more expensive than south of the border 
even though the Americans have eight times the population and a smaller land mass to live on. So they have less natural supply and eight times the natural demand, and yet their prices are far more affordable. You can buy a home for less than half the price on the American side of Niagara Falls than on the Canadian side, even though they are only 15 minutes apart. Vancouver is now the third most expensive housing market in the world, comparing median income to median housing prices. UBS found in 2022 Toronto was the worst housing bubble on planet Earth, both of them more expensive than New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, London, England, and even Singapore. An island, an island with 2,000 times more people per square kilometer than Canadians. We have the most mortgage debt by far of any G7 country as a share of our GDP. What is most astounding about this is that we actually spend far more on residential investment than any other country in the OECD. Residential investment in Canada is 9% of our economy. The OECD average is 4%. In other words, as a relative share of our economy, we are spending twice as much as the rest of, the, of, the, of our competitor countries to build fewer homes. We have the fewest homes per capita of any country in the G7, even though we have by far the most land and we spend by far the most money building homes. How is this possible? How is this possible? We have more land, labor, and lumber than anyone, and yet we can't build homes. Well, the answer is government is standing in the way. What is the number one cost to building a new home in Vancouver today? Land, labor, lumber, permits. Government represents 60% of the cost of a newly built home in Vancouver today, 60%. So the 40% is what you use to pay for the worker, for all the lumber, and the drywall and the land. This is insane. Now we've had wonderful collaboration between all levels of government on housing. I want to say it's been very beautiful to see how well they've collaborated. There have been beautiful press conferences. They've pat each other on the backs. They've, con they've congratulated each other for the amazing job they're doing. And guess what? They're spending more money on housing than ever before. This, we're told, is an achievement. We should not worry about the cost to the person buying the home. We should celebrate that it's even more costly to pay for the programs that created the mess in the first place, we're told. Well, I think that we've been too polite for too long with the politicians who caused this mess. My common sense plan is to use the federal spending power in order to get the, the local bureaucracies that block housing construction out of the way. So what I will do... What I would intend to do is, is link the federal dollars that cities get for housing to the number of homes that they actually allow to be built. So we will require municipalities permit 15% more home building per year as a condition of getting their federal money. If they beat the target, they'll get a bonus. If they miss the target, they will pay a penalty. And it will be stri strictly proportional. So if they beat the target by 10%, they'll get 10% more money. If they miss the target by 10%, they'll get 10% less money. In other words, we'll pay them like realtors and builders. Realtors are paid for the number of homes they build, they, they sell, builders for the number they build. We should pay municipal governments for the number of homes they allow to be completed. That way, the bureaucracies will have an incentive to speed up and lower the cost of home building. I will also, for future transit projects, I will be putting the money from the federal government in a trust the city will have to get bridge financing to build the transit station. And the money will only be released to them when all of the available land around the station is surrounded by high-density apartment complexes that are occupied by people. I'm not going to be building new transit stations with federal money so that we can have parking lots and brand brownfields with tumbleweed all around them. In Hong Kong, they have the only profitable transit system in the world. Why? They sell the air rights right over the station. So the developer actually pays the cost, happily pays the cost of the transit station for the privilege of having 100 stories above it so the people can get on the elevator, go to the bottom, jump on the train, leave late and arrive early to their destination. 
But here in Canada, we have count, I've gone to them, there's even in Vancouver, enormous parking lots and empty spaces around stations. In Winnipeg, the local councillor has been sued because he blocked 2,000 homes right next to a transit station, which was built for those homes. And yet the federal government coughs up the money. I was just at a big parking lot in Point Claire, Quebec, right next to a station that was supposed to take future students to McGill University, but the local mayor said his, his, his constituents want to keep the parking lot. They don't want to have apartments there. So there's a big empty parking lot for a shopping center that is uh, in low demand, right next to a multi-million dollar train station that was supposed to take young people to McGill University. I would say to Point Claire or Winnipeg, you're not getting the federal money until you get the permits and their apartments built right on site. We're going to sell off 6,000 federal buildings and thousands of acres of federal land to build, build, build. And if you have any doubt that this can be done, if you have any doubt that when you remove government, you can get things built, look what the Squamish have done right here in Vancouver. They built, they're building 6,000 homes on 10 acres of land. Why? Because they don't have to go through City Hall. They're on a reserve, right? Imagine if... Imagine if, we, imagine if our cities ran like the Squamish people run their communities. Imagine if, if Calgary was run the way Susina is. Susina is far more business friendly, far faster to approve projects than the bureaucrats at Calgary City Hall. Same is true here in Vancouver. The First Nations are going to be leading the way as the most enterprising communities in this country when I'm Prime Minister. And I will ensure that they are richly rewarded uh, for their entrepreneurial talents. And this is one example, just one example, of how much we can build when we get government out of the way uh, and say yes to uh, positive development for our people. And it's necessary for our economy, because as I mentioned, we're spending 9% of GDP on residential investment, twice the OECD average, in order to build fewer homes. What that has corresponded with is a massive drop in business investment. So what is happening is that as Canadians have to spend more on artificially inflated costs for real estate, they've had less to spend on productive business investment in patents and mines and factories and other income generating assets. So business investment today is lower than it was in 2014, in part because real estate costs are literally sucking up all of the savings. Over time, economists will tell you savings and investment equal each other. The question is, where does your savings go as a country? Ours has to be sucked up by real estate because it's artificially expensive. So instead of making that extra RRSP contribution, which then gets invested in a, in a, in a business, that family has to spend the money on an artificially inflated mortgage payment. Well, imagine if we made housing affordable, they could then put that money into investing, maybe saving up to start a future business that would increase the productivity of our country. We need to increase productive investment in our country. Today, the Canadian worker gets 53 cents of investment for every dollar in the U.S. Think about that, 53 cents on the dollar. We wonder why American wages are outstripping Canadian wages so massively. Think about it. You've got two workers. One of them is getting a dollar of investment for every 53% his competitors gave, the 53% worker is going to be falling behind in tools and technology year after year. And it's not just the Americans. We get only 62 cents of business investment for every year OECD worker. So that investment is lacking and our workers, despite the fact that they are the best in the world, are losing out and losing wages and no wonder they can't pay their bills. We're going to unlock the power of the free enterprise system, make Canada the fastest place on, or on, in the OECD to get a permit, lower taxes, reform the tax system to bring home more production to this country, and productive investment that will mean more powerful paychecks for our people. But to do that, we need to fix the budget. Today, we see interest rates uh, at 5%, which in relative to recent time is very high. Two per full percentage points are directly attributable to government deficits, according to the Scotiabank and its recent study. A group of Canadian economists recently calculated 
that Canadian, uh, the, the only way to bring down interest rates is to bring down uh, deficits that are driving them up. Deficits by necessity put upward pressure on interest rates because they create more demand without creating an, an equivalent supply. That demand then pushes up inflation, which forces the Bank of Canada to push back down in the opposite direction. Our, our politicians, our, our central bankers, and our uh, financial system has debauched our currency under Justin Trudeau. We've created, you know, our money supply. This is coins, bills, and bank deposits, or M2, has gone from $1.8 trillion to $2.4 trillion in the last three years. That's a 32% increase in the amount of cash in our economy, during which time our economy grew by 4%. In other words, the money is growing eight times faster than the stuff that money buys. That doesn't make us richer. Money is just a, an accounting system. It's the technology by which we transfer, well, we transfer value over space and time. It isn't the value in and of itself. You know, if you have an economy with 10 apples and $10, it's a buck an apple. You double the number of dollars in the economy to 20, but you still only have 10 apples. You don't, you're not twice as rich. You just pay twice as much for the apple. And that's what's why we have the inflation we have today. And all of that money supply growth has been because of government deficits, excessive government spending. The cost of government is over 70% more than it was just eight years ago. And most of that has increased, has been funded by borrowing and therefore printing and growing the money supply. This is the John Manley, the great Canadian finance minister, a liberal. God, you wouldn't have expected, James, that I would be praising a liberal on this stage, would you? But he was back from the common sense era of liberals, right? There used to be a common sense consensus between liberals and conservatives on these matters. He said what's happening today is that Justin Trudeau's government is pressing on the gas pedal of inflation while the Bank of Canada is forced to press on the brakes. So here you have the vision of a federal government sitting in the parking lot simultaneously slamming both its feet down, one on the gas, one on the brakes, and the engine is about to blow or the brakes are about to come undone. Uh, that is the economic contradiction we have. So our common sense plan as Conservatives is to bring in a dollar for dollar law that will require my ministers find one dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending. We will cut the we will get rid of the 35 billion dollar infrastructure bank that hasn't completed a single solitary infrastructure project. We'll get rid of the so-called green fund, a billion dollars, 150 million of which has already been misappropriated. We'll get rid of the arrive scam app and cut back on the, the astonishing $21 billion that we're spending now on outside consultants. That's $1,400 for every family in Canada, a 100% increase in eight years, paying these consultants often to do things they admit they don't even do. You know, 76% of the contractors on the ArriveCan app did no work. The biggest contractor is an IT consultant that admits they don't do IT. They have four employees headquartered in the basement of a cottage, and they, they've had a quarter billion dollars of contracts. Nobody knows what they do, but they've shoveled a quarter billion into their pockets. I will be cutting back on the $21 billion we spend on outside consultants. I will thank you. I, And I will cut back. I will cut back on the, uh, the 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 foreign aid we're giving to dictators, terrorists, and multinational bureaucracies. And we will be bringing home that money to rebuild our military here in Canada. That's how we will project power and force in the world. <laughs> By balancing the budget, we will re-establish. Re re our finances and those finances are the number one guarantor of the social safety net that we need as Canadians. We will restore sound money. The Bank of Canada will once again have a mandate to keep inflation low rather than creating cash through uh, scams like quantitative easing. They will instead get back to the core job that the great Brian Mulroney gave them when he mandated the low inflation target of 2%, a mandate that we honored for three decades a mandate that we will restore uh, as the pr sacred promise to our workers that their paychecks and their dollars will retain their purchasing value. 
uh, that is the, the basis of all economic uh, uh, soundness, is to have good money, quality, reliable money, that keeps its promise to the people who earn it. And speaking of keeping promises, we had a promise in this country that if you followed the law, you could live a safe, peaceful life. That promise, too, is broken after eight years of Justin Trudeau. His catch and release laws, Bill C-75, for example, allows the same repeat violent offenders to be released within hours of their arrest. The Vancouver police had to arrest or charge the same 40 offenders 6,000 times in one year. 6,000 arrests for 40 offenders. That's 150 arrests per offender per year. The good news is we don't have a lot of criminals. The bad news is they're very productive. Uh, <laughs> and the, solu the, the further good news is the solution is so obvious. Keep them in jail. I mean, it, it, we all understand if a young person makes a mistake. <laughs> a young person makes a mistake, they should be rehabilitated and given a second chance, of course. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about the career criminals who literally commit as many crimes as their waking hours will allow them to do. They have, the, the police have this saying now, I know it's not very um, polite to say, they, they call it FIDO. When they see a, a crime in progress, they say, forget it, drive on. It's actually not forget it, it's something else. But they, they just drive on. And they tell me why. Because they know that if they arrest the guy, he'll be back on the streets in a couple of hours. So the risk to their physical safety is not worth taking them off the, that criminal off the street for 45 minutes. So they just drive on. We have uh, police officers who will tell you that they're not even done the paperwork on the arrest and the offender is back out on the street, reoffending. Even when they're convicted under liberal legislation backed by the NDP, they get house arrest. So a career car thief can sit at home and watch Netflix or, or, or play Grand Theft Auto um, <laughs> while he's actually doing his sentence. And then we got the news that both Paul Bernardo and Luca Magnata are now in so-called medium security penitentiaries. This is a place where there are hockey rinks and tennis courts and human interaction. They can cook for themselves and live in relative freedom within the walls of that facility. Uh, these uh, murderers released into to medium security by Bill C-83. Now, we were told that by all the experts that these policies were so enlightened that they would lead to less crime that locking up criminals was a good bumper sticker, but in practice it didn't work. Well, the facts are in. The debate is over. Under the previous common sense conservative government, we, we brought in tougher penalties for the repeat violent offenders, and violent crime went down by 25%. You know what else went down? Incarceration. We actually had fewer people in jail. Why? We targeted the, fewest, the, the worst offenders, and we scared the hell out of the rest of them. So they didn't offend, and it worked. We had safe streets and less crime, and now we have precisely the opposite. So a common sense conservative government will, will make it so that repeat violent offenders are no longer eligible for immediate bail. It will be jail and not bail. It will be the full sentences, not early parole. It will be mandatory prison time for the repeat offenders, and we are going to inspect the goods that come in and go out of our ports. Right now, we only inspect 1% of the shipping containers that come in and go out at our ports. No wonder the illegal drugs and guns can get in so easily, and the stolen cars can get out so easily. The Port of Montreal has five CBSA inspectors for half a million containers. They have only six parking lots for stolen cars that they interrupt, so once they filled those six parking lots, they just let all of the other shipping containers, including those they suspect having stolen merchandise in them, go out of the country. That's how insane it is right now. Meanwhile, we're expected to spend something like two to five billion dollars buying back 
the firearms of licensed, law-abiding, trained, and tested firearms owners, people who've been vetted by the RCMP and are statistically proven to be the least likely to commit an offense with a gun, we're going to send police officers to their homes and, and confiscate their lawfully acquired property. We're going to force uh, widows to hand over uh, family heirlooms uh, that they got from their, grand, their great-grandfather instead of going after the ports that are the sieve in the system. My common sense plan will bring scanners to our four biggest ports. So every single shipping container that comes in and goes out will be scanned. We'll take money from back office bureaucracy and high price consultants and put it into frontline resources to secure our ports and stop the illegal <laughs> transit of goods. We'll bring in a tougher jail time for extortions, for auto thefts. Uh, we will reinstate mandatory minimums uh, for the most heinous offenses, and we will end the, the carnage of drugs in our streets. We were told that decriminalizing crack, heroin, cocaine, and other hard drugs was proven by all the experts to work. And then if we added to that taxpayer-subsidized opioids, which they called, ironically, a safe supply, that somehow this was going to uh, protect addicts from overdoses. What has happened? The data is in, the debate is over. We've had 40,000 overdose deaths in the last eight years, a 200% increase. And where these policies have been tried most enthusiastically, the results have been the most horrifying. BC is ground zero because not only does Justin Trudeau's policies apply here, but David Eby and the NDP policies have applied here as well. And that is why, they, what they did is they took a walk down the downtown east side 10 years ago, and they said, why don't we try this everywhere? And they expanded the model nationwide. And the irony is, how did the opioid crisis start in the first place? A bunch of corrupt pharmaceutical companies lied to the medical system so that they could push OxyContin on desperate working class people who were out of luck, out of a job, and out of hope, and they caused a crisis on which they made billions. They knew exactly what they were doing. Documents proved they were literally paying bonuses to the distributors for each overdose they caused. They wanted to supercharge sales. That's how it started. Pharmaceutical grade opioids. And now, what is the so-called safe supply? Pharmaceutical grade opioids profiting the same companies to give out the same drugs that caused the crisis in the first place. And just yesterday, the RCMP confirmed that thousands of these pills have made their way into the hands of organized crime. So your tax dollars are paying for organized criminals to get their hands on the same pharmaceutical drugs that caused the crisis in the first place. This is insanity. I will put an end to it. We will stop funding drugs and start funding treatment and recovery to bring our loved ones home drug-free. You know, I'm a little bit passionate about this subject, uh, all of these subjects, as you can tell. Um, but it's not out of any sense of malice, even towards Trudeau or the NDP. It's out of a sense of desperate disappointment. This is the country I grew up in. This is the country I love. I was born to a 16-year-old mom. She put me up for adoption to a couple of school teachers. And they taught me that in this country, it didn't matter where you came from. It mattered where you were going. It didn't matter who you knew. It mattered what you could do. That's the country my wife came to as a refugee from Venezuela. Her and six family members crammed into a two-bedroom apartment in working-class Montreal. Her father, having been a banker in Latin America, would get up in the morning and jump on the back of a pickup truck and pick fruit so that he could feed his family. Well, now he has his own business. Her brother is a soldier, her other brother a carpenter, her sister is a nurse. She's my wife and hopefully uh, the, the future first lady of this country. It's the country that brought a man I met in Toronto yesterday, his name is Sash. He was, a, he was left homeless and helpless as a small child when his parents abandoned him in South India. Couldn't speak any English, 
of course. He was adopted by a Canadian family who brought him here, and now he's the top-ranked chef in all of Toronto. A movie's being released about him next month. It's the country where you can do anything, where 300,000, 500,000 people sacrifice everything to come and start over again. That's the Canadian dream. This is the country we love. It's not the country we see when we look around us today, but it's the country that we're going to restore. A country where hard work pays off, where people feel safe in their neighborhoods, and as bad as things are right now when we look around us today, it's easy to forget how good they were and how much better they can be. So let me briefly paint the picture of the country that we will restore. It's the picture of children safely skipping off to school, their parents not worried about their safety, of seniors waving to shopkeepers as they drive home with affordable groceries in their trunk and change in their pockets, perhaps passing a Cenotaph, where local legionnaires plant fla fresh flowers in honor of the, the community's heroes. It's a community where, at 8 o'clock, sure as has ever been the case, the sound of kids playing street hockey and parents yelling that it's time for bed, kids yelling back they just need 10 more minutes, and then finally the quiet and the calm. As a young couple sits on their front porch of their brand new home with a Canadian flag hanging from that porch, admiring their paycheck and looking into each, other, into each other's eyes in a way that can only mean we did it. The promise has been kept. It was worth all the sacrifice because finally we're home. Thank you. So clearly your messages have struck a chord with many uh, in the group. And I want to start with affordability and start with our standard of living. We have a lower uh, income per person than we did before the pandemic. We have talked a lot in this room uh, at the Board of Trade about affordability challenges, not just for individuals, but particularly for small businesses and some medium businesses as well. You spoke a lot about cutting costs and about government getting out of the way, which is uh, a welcome message for many in this room. But can you talk more about how you're going to turn around the challenges we see on economic growth? There seems to be that piece of the puzzle has been missing in the narrative federally and provincially for some time. When we talk about what is government's economic growth vision, what would you say to that? The government has to get out of the way for entrepreneurs and workers to grow the economy. We have a gatekeeper economy today where we have the second slowest permits in the OECD. Um, that means that capital has to sit on the sidelines for years while it waits for, uh, to get a maybe out of the regulators. In many cases, this just means that capital doesn't sit on the sidelines, it leaves. We have 800,000, sorry, 800 billion more Canadian dollars invested abroad than the world invests in Canada. So what's happening, you know, there's this debate now about whether Canadian pension funds should be encouraged to invest more in Canada. Well, the question is why aren't they doing it without government encouragement? The answer is because the governments have made this an uninvestable country where you can't get anything done. It, it's just, it, whether it's like a, a small business that's trying to get a permit to expand by an extra thousand feet, square feet, or a pipeline, or a mine, uh, or a housing development, uh, this is a nation in waiting. Uh, and uh, so we need to release those incredible productive energies. We should set a goal, and I'm going to be bringing together the provinces and the municipalities to set this goal. Let's make this the fastest place in the OECD to get a building permit at all three levels of government. And, um, 
that's, uh, that, that would unleash production right across this country. Um, we have a, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest supply of natural resources per capita of any country on Earth, uh, and yet we can't produce those resources. So I will unleash that production, uh, all forms of energy. The solution for our environment is abundant, affordable energy, not expensive uh, and uh, expensive and exclusive energy as our current government. You know this guy, this, this environment minister we have? He's incredible. He's against nuclear. He's against, obviously against oil and gas. Uh, he's against forestry. He wants to shut down Quebec's forestry sector because to, to, he says it's the only way to save 5,000 caribou. Um, you know, and he's against roads. We saw that as well. So I don't know what kind of mud huts he would have us living in, but this is the guy who is in charge of the environment for Justin Trudeau. We need to get rid of him and put in place a common sense minister who understands that we need, that our resources are a benefit to the world, not a hindrance to the environment. And then we need to cut taxes. We, the carbon tax is a massive disadvantage to our industrial sectors that drives production, ironically, to more polluting jurisdictions. By axing the tax, we will lower the cost of production and bring home more of that production to our Canadian economy. Thank you. Vancouver is a port city, and we have a lot of folks in the room who work at waterfront businesses, uh, who work at the port, who are from the labor community. And uh, we also have a lot of folks in the room who are exporters. So can you talk a little bit about your view on expanding trade? It comes at a, a time where you were talking about investment, but expanding trade when we have really had some difficulties around our supply chains over the recent years, uh, floods and fires, uh, uh, labor disruptions, uh, disruption at the port. Uh, so maybe speak a little bit about expanding trade and how that could benefit uh, some of the small and medium businesses in the room especially. Well, we, all, we obviously have uh, the great Ed Fast here. He was our former trade minister and concluded some of our best trade agreements. Uh, and he could answer this better than I could. But uh, we need to make... Uh, I, I, look, I think at this point our biggest challenge is, is no longer just adding new agreements. We have a lot of agreements. We have the CPTPP with uh, most of the Pacific countries. We have Canada, EU. We have obviously... Uh, a, a diminished, unfortunately diminished trade agreement with the states, which I will improve when I'm Prime Minister. Um, but uh, what we need is one, to improve the agreements we have, and two, to make our country a more, a, a, an enterprise zone. So let's focus on the first. My priorities in uh, the U.S., with the U.S., is to get rid of the softwood lumber tariffs. Uh, it's insane that we're still paying these tariffs. Harper resolved the softwood lumber dispute in 100 days of becoming Prime Minister. He got four of our four billion dollars of U.S. collected tariffs reimbursed to Canada, and all of the tariffs eliminated. He did that in 100 days. Trudeau's had three presidents in eight years, and he hasn't solved the new softwood lumber tariffs. Two, we need an end to Buy America, which blocks Canadian businesses from doing subnational work in the U.S. In fact, uh, it's even worse than that. Biden is trying to push a Buy America policy on federal procurement, something that was never. Uh, in the original Buy America. Harper got us an exemption under Obama to Buy America. We need a full exemption to Buy America. We are an ally of the U.S. They should be, we, we, we should have reciprocal free trade on construction projects. And third, we need guarantees that our metals are not going to be subject to future uh, tariffs by, uh, the, the, by our biggest trading partner. Um, and I will be focused on that. I will not be focused on woke virtue signaling and other grandstanding like the previous, like the, the Trudeau government did, which is one of the reasons why we got such a terrible deal under USMCA. And finally, we need to make this into an enterprise zone. We need to make this the best place on earth in which to produce export products. Uh, right now, it's too expensive, and therefore, even if you have a free trade agreement with other countries around the world, we can't beat their costs, because the biggest cost here is government. And by the way, it's not about reducing wages. We're not losing to low-wage countries, countries anymore. We're losing to high-wage countries. Ireland, Switzerland, Australia, Singapore. They're eating our lunch. They have high wages. We need a high-wage economy with a low-cost government.
You were right that you were quite impassioned when you were speaking about judicial reform and public safety issues. Uh, we have long uh, been talking about this is one of the greatest places in the world to live here in Vancouver, but you look around in our downtown core and many retailers are struggling around public safety issues. Um, theft and crime and vandalism is costing well over a billion dollars to retailers in British Columbia alone per year. You did speak about judicial reform, but can you speak more about how you could help to address some of these issues uh, that are, are being felt in Prince George and Nanaimo, and it's not just Vancouver. There's a coalition that has been built here called Save Our Streets, the SOS Coalition, and the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade is one of those members because there is so much concern. So can you speak a little bit about, aside from judicial reform, what else can be done to turn this around? Well, first of all, the, the drug policy has to be completely reversed. Um, I, I'm to the point where I don't even know what motivates the policy right now. You know, I, I thought it was, at first I thought it was just sort of an, a, a naive utopianism that, w that was driving this idea of giving out free drugs and decriminalizing these poisons. Uh, but now that the evidence is so clear that it has been a nightmare, uh, you, have to under you have to ask yourself, what's motivating this policy? Um, because it is totally ravaging our communities. Uh, and my uh, common sense plan is to stop funding the distribution of drugs, uh, stop funding these consumption sites, which are not safe, and instead invest in treatment and recovery services. We know this works. You know, Winnipeg uh, visited an incredible facility uh, where they bring in the uh, addict, they give them uh, detox, counseling, group therapy, sweat lodges for First Nations, exercise and yoga programs. They then have, they're building a attached housing so that the graduates of the program can live in transition nearby, come back for a therapy session, for some exercise, or maybe even to mentor an incoming addict. And the success rates are incredible. That's how we're going to bring our loved ones home drug-free and, and break the cycle of addiction uh, that is raging out of control in our country. And that will address some of the issues well, I, that I think we're feeling. Look, I think if you look at some of the, like, whether it's, it's Timmins or the downtown east side of Vancouver, the, 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 inner, the, the inner city chaos is, is partly driven by drug addiction. There's no question about it. And that's what drives the, the theft. They're, they're stealing so they can buy drugs. And so the petty theft is largely the result of addiction. Then it graduates into more violent acts by more desperate people. So we have to de defeat the, cr the drug addiction crisis if we're going to stop the crime crisis. You spoke in great detail um, about housing, and we know in Vancouver it is a long, long challenge for us that uh, really hampers our ability to attract and retain talent. And you spoke about cutting costs and government getting out of the way and speeding up permitting and linking uh, dollars, federal dollars uh, to municipalities to targets. Are there other considerations that you would be that would be on the table, whether it would be interest-free mortgages like the US does or cutting taxes elsewhere within the system to really start to unlock some of the value and to change the crisis that we're in? What do you mean? What kind of tax policies? Uh, looking at any kind of the taxes that are built into the housing system right now. Like what else could be on the table to really see some meaningful change quickly? I, I'm open to the, to the idea of cutting more taxes on home building, and we're looking at different options on that. Uh, we've supported taking uh, the GST, HST off of uh, rental construction. Um, we obviously are going to get rid of the carbon tax, which raises the cost of transporting materials, but also, for example, drywall has natural gas ingredients in it. It becomes more expensive with the carbon tax. By axing the tax, we'll bring homes that people can afford. Um, but the biggest tax of all is the massive delays in getting permits for construction. And this is where I put the challenge over to the business community. You know, the home builders tell us, th what I just said the home builders have been saying for years. My question to the home builders is, what have you done to defeat gatekeeping local politicians in elections? Where is your coalition to defeat these politicians these mayors and councillors who stand in the way of home building. 
Because if you don't do that, it's not going to change. You can you know, write another essay or commission another paper by the C.D. Howe Institute, but if these politicians keep getting elected to block home building, then they will, uh, they'll keep blocking home building. So that's what I mean when I say the business community actually has to step up, because the only way we're going to make homes affordable for people is to get the gatekeeping out of the way at all three levels of government, and it's time that the home building uh, companies actually play a leadership role in the politics of driving that change. I could keep you on the stage for a very long time with lots more questions, but I do know you have other places to be. So if I could ask one last question to wrap up our conversation. We recently lost Canada's 18th Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney. Friends and foe alike gave quite the tributes to him. Right. I, I, you know, I, I really reflected a lot about what Jean Chrétien said uh, and talked about how they took themselves seriously, their work not so much. And it really was a different time in politics. Uh, he was a consequential leader, Mr. Mulroney, uh, and many would say quite an incredible statesman. When you reflect on his legacy, what comes to mind? And then when you think about what you're going into now, in maybe October of 2025, what kind of leadership do we need today, and how could you bring the country together? Well, first of all, I reiterate my uh, love and support for the Mulroney family. Uh, Mark Mulroney, his son, is one of my best friends, uh, and I was very sad when he called me with the news uh, that his father had passed. And I'm also very grateful for the mentorship Brian and Mila have provided Anna and I um, on his political legacy. Uh, a couple of things. One, though his agenda was very controversial at the time, very controversial, you mentioned that everyone praises him now. Well, it's, at the time, he would tell you that that wasn't the case. He had to take on a lot of entrenched interest in order to achieve the, the uh, frankly, the revolution that he brought at the time, privatizing Air Canada and numerous other crown corporations that had been very entrenched, uh, reducing the cost of government. He brought in among the slowest uh, spending growth of any government in history. He balanced the operational budget. We had an ongoing deficit because of the interest on the preceding Trudeau government's uh, debt. He obviously opened up Canada to free trade with the United States. He brought in the inflation target. Up until then, the Bank of Canada had no mandate uh, of any clear purpose, so they just kept printing money and leading to double-digit inflation. He brought in a 2% inflation target. And he, internationally, he was firmly on the side of freedom against Soviet communism, which had, was a change from the previous government. And he was on the side of freedom in South Africa against apartheid, which was a lonely position for him to take in the Western world at the time, but obviously he has been proven right. Um, so the lesson I take from that is that he was prepared to stand alone in order to stand for what was right. And then it wasn't easy in the short run, but in the long run, he has been vindicated. And finally, the fact that everyone has heaped so much praise on him in the last days since his passing is proof of the common sense consensus that he helped forge. The aforementioned policies that I just listed, though they were controversial in 1984, they became almost a unanimous consensus thereafter. Balanced budgets, free enterprise, privatization, fast support for our resource sector, all of those things were widely supported by all three of the major political parties up until 2015. And what I'm hoping to do is bring back the common sense consensus that we had among liberals, NDP, and conservatives for those values that made our country so prosperous, so safe, and such a wonderful place to be uh, up until 2015. That is what we're going to restore and that is what we're going to bring home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pierre, thank you very much. Recognizing that this is uh, one of the first uh, business addresses that you've made and certainly the first Board of Trade or Chamber of Commerce, we were um, delighted to be able to host you and thank you for making time in your schedule. Really Excellent. appreciate it. I do have a couple of uh, thank yous as well as that I was, uh, would be 
uh, I would feel horrible if I didn't thank them because they, they do make these events possible. So to our sponsors, our supporting sponsors, BC Maritime Employers Association and Concord Pacific Development, our partners at Fairmont Hotel Vancouver, and thank you for the service and the meal this morning and business in Vancouver. And a brief but uh, very sincere thank you to our pillar partners. They include CN, YVR, BCIT, Air Canada, and RBC. And finally, to all of you, on a Friday morning and on International Women's Day, thank you for making time for a really important conversation this morning. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.